The Thai people call Bang Quang the big tiger. They say it eats men alive. I have no clue when I will die. They could inject me today or tomorrow. In the West, it has been known as the Bangkok Hilton. But there's 24 in the room, which is really hard, especially just to get to the toilet because everyone's all over the floor. The prison is notorious. It's been the subject of novels and movies, but the Thai authorities have never allowed the reality of life inside these walls to be filmed. Until now. Bangkwang prison is at boiling point. In the last few years, the prison's population has trebled because of a government crackdown on drug trafficking. 7,000 men are now packed into a prison built to hold around half that number. There are serial killers and multiple rapists locked up here, but most prisoners are in for drug dealing offenses. In Thailand, drug sentences are harsh. Minimum 25 years, to life, to the death penalty. The prison guards have arranged extra heavy security, but they're nervous. They are unarmed and outnumbered 50 to 1. With so few guards, roll call is taken twice a day to make sure no one's missing. If one bar has a different tone, it means someone's trying to file through it. Three thirty is lockdown. The prisoners spend fifteen hours a day in their cells. You literally cannot lie flat on your back. Put your hands on your stomach. If you do that, your elbows are on two two other beds. That's pretty damn close. And you go, in, and that's fifteen hours a day. In here, if one prisoner gets sick. So do all his cellmates. I'd say your beds must be about that big, with five foot long. But my feet are always sticking over the bed. You're always touching someone in the room. It's really hard. The lights stay on 24 hours a day. Thai officials have said 63% of prisoners have mental health problems, and one in 10 is suicidal. There is a lot of people who's losing their minds. Well, I'm sleeping next to a guy now. He just walks around all day, walks around talking to his cell. I'm in the room next to him at night, and I've seen a dog scratch less. Last night, he was itching that much. There must have been about three different places where he was bleeding from, and he actually got blood on my bed. Many will die here and many more will be put to death. Just after the new Thai government came to power, 
These men had their executions in Bangkwang broadcast live on Thai television as a warning to drug pushers. In the street outside the prison, there's another warning. This sign shows 560 inmates face execution for drug offences. Okay. Ampon Bertling is one of them. His shackles are welded on permanently. He faces death by lethal injection. The execution order could come at any time. The Thai government says drug pushers have destroyed the future of many of the country's young people and deserve to die. All my life I hated drugs more than anything. I never thought that I would be arrested because of it. I told my kids, don't touch them, don't get close to them. I admitted that I was guilty. Why has society punished me so harshly? Why don't they give me another chance? I never committed a crime before. The tough sentences are popular. The prison's resident Buddhist monk, like the majority of Thai people, has little sympathy for drug traffickers. Drug dealing is a type of mass murder. It can destroy whole families. If a child becomes addicted to drugs, he drags down his whole family with him. The child starts to steal everything, which ruins the family's reputation in society. A murderer typically kills just one person. Drug dealers don't kill just one person. They ruin everyone's lives. My children try to cheer me up. They say to me, it's okay. Don't be sad, father. If people can't see the goodness of your heart, heaven can. Thailand is fighting a drug problem far worse than anything yet seen in the West. The country is a major through route for drugs. Heroin and speed pills are manufactured in Burma. The drugs are then trafficked through Thailand to Europe and America, with much of the profit going to the Thai agents. But now, Thailand has a major drug problem at home. Metamphetamine pills, called Yabba, now as cheap as a dollar a pill, are flooding the local market. In recent years, Yabba has found its way into schools. Child addicts in the streets have become a common sight. It's called the crazy drug. The government said it's Thailand's number one national security issue. I had a job watching Yabba supplies. My employers paid all my daily expenses. They paid for my house as well. All I had to do was keep an eye on the pills. When we had a client, my boss would call me, and I would make the delivery. Two years ago, Thai television broadcast details of cases of violence by people high on Yabba. This man threatened to drop his own son off a building. Thai Prime Minister vowed to wipe out the country's entire drug problem within just 60 days. 10,000 people were arrested. More than 2,000 alleged drug dealers were shot dead in the streets. The authorities said it was gang on gang killings. Human rights groups say it was the Thai police. One day, the police caught my partner and forced him to call me to deliver some pills to an undercover officer. I was arrested immediately. The police decided to arrest any suspect they could find. That's why prisons are overcrowded these days. They weren't looking for the real criminals, otherwise they wouldn't have bothered with them. (laughs) 
Caught in the crackdown were hundreds of foreigners. 20-year-old Michael Connell from Bury in Manchester says he smuggled drugs to fund his second holiday in Thailand. So what were you arrested for? I'm arrested for importing 3,400 ecstasy from England to Thailand and I got caught at the airport. When they found them, I knew what was going to happen to me because any, anywhere in the world, if you get caught importing drugs, you go into prison. So as soon as they found them, I knew I was going to prison. Connell's story is of the typical tourist turns convict variety. He was one of the hundreds of thousands of young Britons who visit Thailand every year. Many of them, young travelers easily tempted by the readily available cheap booze, drugs, and sex. I just came for an holiday the first time, and I enjoyed it so much. And when I was leaving, I was heartbroken to go. The culture, the people are all dead friendly, mainly the weather, because England, sunshine doesn't happen very often. Overwhelmed by what seemed an idyllic lifestyle, Connell, like many of these travellers, got a false sense of security. He visited Koh San Road, the backpackers' ghetto, in the centre of Bangkok where many plan their beach trips in Thailand. He went on to beach resorts and the famous full moon parties where ecstasy is plentiful. So I wanted to get back, but it's so expensive to come over. I had to find a way to make money. Connell didn't want to say where he got the money to buy the drugs. In November 2003, he arrived at Bangkok's International Airport for his second vacation in the land of smiles. Customs officials found the ecstasy tablets in his travel bag after they were detected by an x-ray scan. I went to collect my bag and for some reason it was already off the rail going round. So I just picked it up, walked through the customs and then they said, what can I search your bag? So they put my bag through the x-ray machine opened the bag, put their hand in, just pulled them out. From when I got arrested, they had a big sign up in the customer's office, from which that scared me a lot. I just sat there looking at it and just praying that I don't get the death penalty. The pills, with a street value of £50,000, were wrapped in plastic and hidden in two face cream jars. Michael escaped the death penalty by pleading guilty, but was sentenced to 99 years in prison. Don't worry about me, I'm fine. I'm more worried about yourself. could happen to you in the time you've been here. Um, but the biggest fear is not knowing when I'm getting out. That's the biggest fear that I've got. Connell has been put in Building 5, which is reserved for young and dangerous prisoners. Bernhard Cholsim, a prison director, leads the visit into Connell's cell block. Twenty guards gather for extra security, but there is tension in the air. Open the door, meeting fight. ประตูเนาะมี
Compound 5 contains about 1,000 prisoners, but there are only 13 or 14 guards on duty. If the prisoners wanted to try something, there'd be nothing we could do about it. If the prisoners wanted to knock the guards out, we couldn't do anything. Warden Bunhan is concerned about the safety of the female Thai interpreter. Normally hundreds of prisoners mill around this open space, but now they are herded against the walls. Before this visit, the guards had raided the block, seizing any personal possessions regarded as against the rules, like mobile phones and drugs. They're not happy. The prison bosses have a system of prisoner guards called trustees. The prisoners call them blue shirts and blue boys. They have the power to search and to discipline the other prisoners. It's difficult to be a foreigner here because in the building I'm in, I'm the only white guy in the building, so I stand out a lot. Hey, hey there. And I do get looks off a lot of people, but I just ignore them most of the time and just carry on what I'm doing. Are you alright? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where you hang out, of it? Yeah, that's yeah, where I hang out, yeah. Right. Only place where it's quiet. Right, right. Awesome. As a new inmate, Connor must wear leg shackles for the first three months. Uh, well, I can't really play football at the moment because I've got the chains around my legs. But I've got another month now left with them on. So hopefully they should be off in a month. Then I can play football. Life in Bangkwang largely depends on how much money a prisoner has. Poor inmates work for the guards or for other prisoners to survive. A lot of people here haven't got any money. So you've got to basically help the ones who haven't got the money. So he doesn't be washing. And then I give him food and stuff like that and cigarettes. Each inmate has a bank account in the prison. They can buy food and toiletries from the prison shop using a coupon system. Michael also gets food and vitamins from the British Embassy. You buy food every day. So you can just buy it. Uh, sometimes you can do cooking. Plus the empty comes every now and again. Well, every six weeks they come and they bring me like stuff like fresh bacon, ham, cheese. It's not the empty who gives us the money every month. It's a charity called Prisoners Abroad who gives us two thousand baht every month, which is actually a really big help because my money, my family, ain't got that much money to help me with. I don't know. It's too late. Let us. The guards have had enough. It's time to leave Connell's cell block. Bunhan's tour continues with a visit to the maximum security building. He travels there in the prison transport vehicle, a golf cart. The inmates call it the jungle. It's solitary confinement, Bang Kwang style. <laughs> I've heard about the toilet, there's not a toilet in there, it's just a little bucket in the room. One guy said you're lucky if you can just lie down on your back, flat, but I plan not to go up there. This is an example of a stubborn prisoner who lacks discipline. That's why he's isolated from others. This is a fair punishment. He stabbed another inmate at least 10 times, and when the guard tried to stop the fight, he was attacked as well and got 10 stitches. We forgive him, 
We will try our best to rehabilitate him. Other people always imagine that we are tough, but in reality we are not. A large percentage of the inmates in solitary are from Nigeria, a country that has some of the world's most organized drug courier gangs. Why are you in solitary? Example, uh, I thought we had a problem with another prison. How long have you been in solitary for? Three months. Can you get out during the day? Yeah, I'm uh, twice in a week. Get out twice in a week? It's just for one hour. One hour. Nigerian drug couriers take delivery of heroin in Bangkok and send it home to their capital of Lagos. With Nigeria's rampant corruption, getting the drugs through Lagos International Airport does not pose much of a problem. In Nigeria, the drugs are repacked into smaller parcels, often into condoms that couriers swallow and take to Europe and America. The Nigerian prisoners are problematic. They try to sell drugs even though they don't take them themselves. I've talked to them. I understand that they're from a poor country. They need money to support their families. What are you in here for, man? Uh, I have problem with my building. Your said building? I said I use heroin. Many Africans don't have embassy support, unlike American and European prisoners. They have little or no legal help. How many years do you have to serve? Uh, I'm now on life sentence. What's it like in here? Well, we provide for ourselves. We don't have enough uh, food. So we have to survive on our own. In the past, Nigerians outside have smuggled drugs and mobile phones into the prison, often hidden within food. In this way, the Nigerian inmates could deal drugs and earn money. The Nigerians try to hide drugs in all kinds of places, but we usually catch them. They have their tricks. Sometimes they hide it in cosmetics or in the food. Sometimes they swallow it and then excrete it into the toilet. We don't have any way to detect that. When we catch them, they are punished. Do you miss your family? I miss my children. I have my children. Would you like to go home? I can't <laughs> No. Does anybody come visit you here? Please shut up once in a while. Another Western prisoner who agreed to be interviewed was 47-year-old Andrew Hawke from London. Uh, death row. They've got their chains welded on. That's my home for the last five and, five and a half years. A home for how much longer? Nobody in this place can say with any degree of certainty when they're leaving. Nobody at all. Permission for filming is denied inside Hawke's compound. The last visit inside Connell's proved too dangerous and disruptive. But they do allow a camera to be given to a guard who agrees to film Andrew's daily routine, but under the supervision of a senior prison official. Well, I'm going up to show you where I sleep. 
What were you arrested for? Stupidity. Uh, it's 800 odd grams heroin, airport. What led you to make the decision to try to do this? Desperation, financial and personal. I was homeless at the time. I'd just been made that. The personal stuff I don't really want to go into. Most of the time, I end up asleep. Fifteen hours a day in this room. Every day. That's a lot of hours. Hawk made his decision to smuggle heroin after an offer in a pub in Amsterdam. I really didn't want to do it. Everything was screamed against me not to do it. But I went ahead and did it anyway. Oh, I was pouring out my sorrows and woes and basically talking to strangers like you don't talk to anybody else. Let's just say I was suicidally depressed. <sighs> to be honest, I was thinking about taking a late night ferry and jumping off it. I was at the end of the rope, frankly. problems in life. What? He said that you could fly over and do a job for me over in Thailand, give you some money, be a tourist for a couple of weeks and fly back. I said, okay. That must have been about three or four in the morning, by half past two the next afternoon, hung over and pretty drunk. Got taken to the airport, put in a plane. I was here. Once I was here, I was pretty much committed because I didn't have a return ticket to any or enough money to buy one for that matter. I was arrested right before I entered the aircraft. There was a metal detector thingy you've got to walk through. God knows what triggered it off. I just remember my heart going like a trip hammer and I was waiting. I waited for at least half an hour before the customs guys showed up. And they checked the stuff. And one of the customs guys said, maybe it's milk powder. And I just looked at him and said, yeah, I bloody well hope so. But it wasn't. We arrived here April Fool's Day. Very funny. Hawk was sentenced to death. Cut to 50 years when he pleaded guilty. Oh, I deserve to be punished. I certainly do. The punishment is so severe. This is my friend Adrian. The reason he's lying down is because he's too tall to stand up. So, Adrian, what does it feel like to be on TV again? <laughs> Say hello to your friends at home, Adrian. Hello. Adrian, you're pleading guilty. Oh, welcome to Bangkok, people. Yeah. You're pleading guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. You see yet another man in the system who is not guilty. You. <laughs> oh, I pled guilty from the start, my friend. I was caught red out. Hawk is ordered to show off the new gas cooking area for the guard's camera. This is the area where all the cooking facilities are. The gas bottles all behind. As you can see, there's only six rings. So a lot of people use charcoal instead. But the gas here is provided. Just off shot are about 400 people showering, which you cannot be shown under the laws of obscenity in Thailand. So we will now move on. Okay, enough. It's 
my friend. He's a librarian. He looks after all the books. <laughs> Most of these books were put here either by me or Adrian. About Ned Kelly and his life and time, short as they were. Okay. What are you reading there, Bob? Yeah, I just did in uh, How to Live in Thailand. You just did in Thailand? Found out How to Live in Thailand, yeah, my friend. That's when you found out. Too late you found out. Yeah. Okay, that's enough. I think it's my anger at the British government that's halfway responsible for me holding on to my sanity. A number of letters I've written to the various departments of, of the Foreign Office, Home Office, and the sheer gall of the replies keeps me going. Heroin smuggler Hawke is desperate to leave. He is subject to the rules of British prisoner transfer agreements. If he returns to the UK, he must serve half the sentence he received abroad. Other countries are far more lenient. Even if I went back and did the half that the British government insists I do, I'd be nearly 67. If I was a Dane or a German, I'd have four and a half years left. Because these American prisoners, they get transferred back home after eight years. And then they do two to three months in prison in America and then, then get released. So a lot of people are really upset about this. Well, the Americans go their own way. No one can stop what the Americans do. We should at least get the same treatment as the rest of the Europeans do. And none of them do more than 10 years, so why the hell should we? In the last few years, Bangkwang Prison has become part of the tourist trail in Thailand. Notices in guest houses encourage tourists to visit inmates. The prisoners call them banana visits because it makes them feel like monkeys in a cage. Prisoners on drug offences are allowed one visit a week, while all other inmates, including murderers, get two. The prisoners sit behind a wire mesh and the visitors at the other side of a second wire mesh, about 10 feet apart. For each pair, it's like trying to conduct a conversation across a busy road. Two years ago, we were just curious to visit uh, somebody in uh, prison. And we met a boy from Malaysia, and we felt so sorry for him. But we know he is innocent. He's really innocent, but he has lifetime. I think it's too bad. <laughs> With her parents. She stays with her parents. Yes, when they're guilty, okay, but not life. Not life. That's too long. Don't you think? Yeah, I get visits from Tories sometimes who goes to the British Embassy and wants to visit a British prisoner. Or sometimes people who come over from England who see me on the news and all that from, this, from Manchester. Adrian gets a visit from a fellow Canadian who read about him on the internet. A friend that I knew from before who appeared just out of the blue one day. That one I was <laughs> taken aback. Yeah. Sarah, you know who you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they make my day, in fact. You know, I come here, it's food for that, and they made my day. He's a nice guy. He just make a mistake and that's all, you know. That made me thinking about how we are living in a paradise in the West, you know, compared to here. Uh, he's got 50 years, he told me. 50, 50 years, could you imagine? He is 40 or a little bit over 40. That's going to be, he's going to be here for the rest of his life.
One of the prisoners is from Afghanistan. No, no Afghan embassy, of course. Yeah, because you know everything is wrong in Afghanistan. And I in contact with any embassy, brother, please, not the bad. So there's nobody helping you on the outside? Nobody helping Nobody helping me. I'm sorry, when you go to the bad time, come back, you know how much space to see. And food is not enough at all. It's and everything can you buy yourself. Some guy came, I'd say, about three weeks ago. He was telling me that he's been all around Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, Burma. And when he was telling me, I was just thinking, great, I'm in prison. <laughs> I'm sleeping next to a guy who's not washed his bed now for two months. I've told him to wash his bed, but he don't wash it, and I'm sure I'm getting mites off his bed or something like that. I've asked him to wash his bed, but he's he's not all there, so he's just walked off, and he's still not washing his bed yet. Avoid any open wounds of any kind. With the water here, you have to. That's unfiltered river water we have to wash in. Try not to get sick. The worst thing you can do is get ill. Seriously ill inmates end up in the prison hospital, which is understaffed and understocked. Tuberculosis and HIV are rife. But the patients remain prisoners. Many prisoners have developed the full-blown AIDS virus. It happened because they use the same needles when they are chewing dope. And sexual, you know. Hospitals in Thailand are partly supported by donations, but not this one. Last year I was sick in the hospital for 23 days. I saw people, I mean by the bed, by my side, they die and die every day. I'm here, I can see the, the ambulance come to pick up the casket, dead body, take up. I see. What you have there? It's a Manchester United top. Well, I'm a really big fan of Manchester United. Even David Beckham can come over and get me out if he wanted to. Me, Elena, and In Bang Quang, there is a cross section of Thai society. It's a society which is very tolerant of transvestites and those who've had sex changes. The cameraman guard is sent to film some lady boys, as they are known here in Thailand. These ladyboys live together in compound four. 
Nong is 34 and was a showgirl at the resort of Pattaya. She says she smuggled drugs to pay for breast implants. I wanted to get my breasts done, but my parents refused to give me money to do it. So I made a decision. My friends convinced me to do it. I had no idea back then what I was doing. I kept delivering bags for them. I had no clue. I spent the money on the breast operation, and three days after the operation, I was arrested. So far, I can't find someone that I like. The man I liked was transferred, but in this building there are a thousand men. I got a 40-year sentence. I have already been here for 10 years, so I have to stay for another 30 years. But they told me I might get pardoned this year, so they've asked me to behave myself. Occasionally, Thailand's king grants a royal pardon. It is Nong's only hope of getting out and having a sex change operation. During the day, Nong works as a makeup artist at the newly launched BKP TV, the world's only prison cable TV station. The station is run by prisoners with prior experience. The anchor, a former radio announcer, has a life sentence for drug smuggling. I'm the host and anchor of BKP Cable TV in Bang Quang Prison. I'm beginning my sixth year behind bars on a drug offense. The station started off as a collaboration of prisoners under the supervision of the guards. We got a great response from our audience, our fellow inmates. Last year, the prison bosses installed televisions in the cells. Dear viewers, BKP TV broadcasts beautiful and romantic music videos for you, Monday to Friday. Prisoners can now enjoy Thai music videos, the latest movies, and they've even had episodes of Mr. Bean to calm the prisoners down. Drug dealer Amporn Bertling is still waiting for his appointment at the lethal injection chamber. Both he and the executioner will only get two hours' notice before the execution. Frankly, I'm afraid to die. But I was also afraid of starving. I did it because I had nothing to eat. I didn't have any money. I couldn't get a job. Warden Ben Han sees the need for capital punishment, but only after all legal means of appeal have been exhausted. Children can see that we execute criminals, and as a result, they'll be afraid of committing crimes. Here in Thailand, we don't take execution lightly. Cases have to go to the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, and then to the King before an execution is approved. We're not a cruel country. At Bang Quang, we've only executed a total of 300 prisoners, not thousands. Opponents of the death penalty say that it is not a deterrent and that innocent men always end up being executed. There is one man, young man. He was accused of rape and killed as a girl, six-year-old girl. This man, I know him. I've been in prison with him. I told him, did you do it? And he said, no, he swear. Even I'm, he's going to die, he swear. He did not do it. And on the way he goes, he's going to execution. He child, I did not do it. Why kill me? Why? 
Yes, we should have a second chance. People aren't all bad. Some prisoners here are innocent. When I hear I have to do an execution, I go back home, I wash and meditate to clear my thoughts. Then I leave for the prison at four in the afternoon. This is the head executioner of Bang Quang. He's agreed to demonstrate his routine on an execution day but he will remain nameless and faceless for security reasons. At my first execution, I worried whether I would be able to go through with it, whether I could carry out the job properly. But I didn't think too much, and I wasn't scared or emotional once I did it. I try not to think too much. We have to think we are paying for our sins. That's why we are suffering like this. The first thing I do is go to the prison shrine and ask for blessings. He passes a life-size concrete giraffe that graces the landscaping around the execution chamber. The giraffe is just to liven up the place. When I pay my respects, I pick up a little bit of earth put it on my head, because everybody comes from the earth. In the end, we all go back to the earth. We should ask Mother Earth to protect us from all danger. On a real execution day, the condemned prisoner will meet with the head monk of Laplay Temple, which is just on the other side of the wall from the execution chamber. He has given the last rites to every prisoner executed at Bang Quang during the last 17 years. Thailand is a Buddhist country, so people are always asking why executions are allowed here. Yes, killing is sinful, but Buddhism teaches us to look at the intention behind the act. The intention here is to protect the country, so it is permitted. Since the Sukhothai dynasty, the king has gone out to fight wars. He and his troops have had to kill enemies to protect the country. Execution is the same. The monk tells the condemned they're lucky to die by execution because they can prepare their minds properly for death. Giving last rites to a prisoner is not easy, but I've got used to it. I tell him that he is lucky that he knows his destiny and can clear his conscience. Unlike me, if a car hits me right after this, I might not have a chance to die with a pure mind. But he can prepare himself, listen to the monks, clear his mind and talk to people. It's a blessing in disguise. Until 2003, the executioners put the condemned to death by machine gun. They shot them in the heart from behind, so the departing spirit could not see the face of the killer and come back to haunt him. Blood splatters are still visible on the wall. The last person to die by firing squad was executed on December 12 last year. Director General Nati then decided to change the system to lethal injection. 
because it's more humid. Because uh, uh, when we use uh, uh, firing squads, the old method, uh, sometimes they are crying and shouting, and sometimes they, they when when when, they, when we shoot, they they and they get down, uh, their blood is spreading, and sometimes they are not dying uh, immediately. So we have to take them and shoot again. So by new method, uh, we uh, they will be it will be more humid. They they can uh, it's not it will not damage their body. I come here to prepare the injections. The first dose is a tranquilizer. When we push switch number one, it shows to the people outside that we're doing step one. By the time the first injection is done, he'll already be unconscious. When the first injection is done, I push number two, the muscle relaxant. Then we go on to the third and lethal dose. When all the lights are on here and outside, the observers know that we've injected all three doses. I have no clue when I will die. They could inject me today. I try not to dwell on it too much. I tell myself that we live one life and we die only once. If you're picked for execution tomorrow, it's your bad karma. When the prisoner's dead, we put the corpse down here. We take the fingerprint of the corpse to check if he's the same person as the one we had before the execution. We take fingerprints before and after the execution. After we've done the prints, we put the body in the coffin and put it in this room, right here. Here we have cool air to preserve the body. If we have four bodies, we'll keep them here. We bring the body outside to check again if it's the same person. We don't want to give the wrong body to the relatives by mistake. After that, we put the body back in the coffin and walk this way. Finally, they go out of that door. The small red door is how prisoners on death row leave the big tiger. They call it the ghost gate. The gate only opens the day after an execution. Prisoners carry the coffin out into the temple grounds. If relatives are waiting, they claim the body. If not, the body is left in the temple cemetery. When there's no space left, the monk will cremate the bodies. He now guards the urns of the unclaimed. I still have them and have labeled their names. This was Mr. Somsak Pornarai and Mr. Deja Sawanasuk. He raped his stepdaughter. This was Mr. Tapoy Ho, a Karen tribesman. I pray for them from time to time. I have to take a look at their names. I saw all of them prior to their deaths, so I can recall some of them. I've always believed that people must face the consequences of their actions. Even if you don't get caught today, one day your karma will catch up with you. It's July 2004. Ampon Bertling still awaits his fate on death row. I pray for another chance. I pray that I might live a new life, even if it means I have to start again from zero. Director General Nati is building new prisons to ease the overcrowding problem at Bang Huang. Heroin smuggler Andrew Hawke still clings to the slim hope of a pardon from the king or a sympathetic ear from Her Majesty's government. But I think that you'd never get out. 
the sentences such as mine at 50 years, I would have to be 91 before I got out. Impossible. Ecstasy smuggler Michael Connell has served six months of his 99-year sentence. What I am very worried about, about people forgetting me. I'm lucky at the moment I've got a few people writing to me, but I've got a feeling myself it's going to die down after a bit, which I'm hoping it doesn't. Have your say on tonight's show and explore a world.